Matthew chapter 18, the church was still future. Now in Acts chapter 1 verse 5, Acts 1 verse 5, For John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized by the Holy Spirit not many days hence. So notice in verse 5, spirit baptism had not yet begun. They shall be baptized not many days hence, but it had not yet begun. And so the church was still future as of Acts 1-5, because spirit baptism was still future as of Acts 1-5. And without the spirit of baptism, there is no church. Now the question is, exactly when the spirit of baptism begin? And the correct answer would be chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. And while this is the correct, an that is the correct answer, that is when spirit baptism began, but there's a small problem here. He does not mention spirit baptism. He mentions being spirit filled, but being spirit filled is not the same as being spirit baptized. So how can we show evidence the spirit baptism began here as well in chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Let's now go to chapter 11 of Acts. In chapter 10 of Acts is when Peter receives his unique revelation from the rooftop of where he was praying. And he saw in his vision a sheet coming down with all kinds of different animals, both kosher and non-kosher animals, and then he was told to kill and eat, which he refused to do because that would violate the kosher laws of the Mosaic laws, well, the rabbinic law. And, he's, and the vision came to him three different times. Each time he rejected doing what God asked him to do. That's when God told him, what God has made clean, don't call it unclean. But God has made kosher, don't make it unkosher. And he was meditating on what he had just experienced when suddenly Gentile soldiers of, the, of Rome come asking Peter to go with him over to the into um, Caesarea because there was a centurion there who was a believer in the God of Israel, but they hadn't yet come to understand what they had to believe to be saved. And so Peter joined with them in chapter 10, and he presented the gospel to them, and the house of Cornelius and those who were with him all became believers. And for the first time, uncircumcised Gentiles entered the body of the Messiah. For the first time, uncircumcised Gentiles received the spirit of baptism and entered the body. Uh, furthermore, as we read, uh, in chapter 10, he didn't leave right away to go back to Jerusalem. He stayed with them long enough to teach them some basic principles of discipleship and so on. And this news began to spread all the way back to Jerusalem. As we come to chapter 11, when Peter got back to Jerusalem, guess who attacks him? His fellow members of the congregation of Jerusalem. So in verse 2 of chapter 11, and when Peter was come uh, come up to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision contended with him, saying, You went into men uncircumcised, and you did eat with them, and that was a no no. The only Jewish believers did not always know there's been a new point of God's prophetic program and everything else. And therefore, because of Peter's actions, he violated certain aspects of both Mosaic law and, um, and the Abrahamic law. It must, didn't matter that he broke rabbinic law, but he also broke taught the laws of the Mosaic law, which was a crucial issue. And that's why he was attacked by fellow Jewish believers. As to defend his actions, he does two things. Number one, he told them about the unique experience God gave him in chapter 10, and he could not be disobedient to the heavenly vision, and he was obligated by God to go to the home of uncircumcised Gentiles to give them the gospel. But the second line defense is based upon what the Messiah said in Acts 1.5, stay until that you shall be baptized by the Spirit not many days hence. Now look down to verse, um, verse 15 of chapter 11. And, I say, and as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them 
if it's an us at the beginning. Not, now let's break the verse down. Verse 15, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them, who are to them, the uncircumcised Gentiles of chapter 10. Even as on us, who are the us, the Jewish believers of the Church of Jerusalem, at the beginning, and when the Spirit first fall upon the Jewish believers of Jerusalem, Acts 2, verses 1 through 4. So that was the, so the experience that the Jewish believers had in Acts 2, verses 1 through 4, the same experience that the Gentile believers in their uncircumcision also received the same experience. And now look at verse 16. And I remember the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized by the Holy Spirit. So here he now quotes what the Messiah said in Acts 1.5. And putting verses 15 and 16 together, the Spirit first fell upon the Jewish believers in Acts uh, 2 verses 1 through 4. That's when spirit baptism began, that's when the church began. But the um, until Acts 10, it was only Jewish believers that were baptized by the Spirit, and those Gentiles that had previously converted to Judaism were also baptized back in Acts 2, but for the first time, we have uncircumcised Gentiles who experienced this blessing of being spirit baptized into the body. So number one, what is the church? The church is the body of the Messiah. Is composed of all Jewish believers, no Gentile believers, united into one body, who enter this body by spirit baptism. And when the spirit baptism began, in Acts 1 5, it was still future. And according to Acts 11, verses 15 and 16, spirit baptism began in Acts 2, verses 1 through 4. And only church saints are going to be involved in what we call the rapture event. And therefore, we should keep this in mind as we now move to Roman numeral 2, which will deal with the rapture event. Let's begin with John chapter 14. John chapter 14. Now, simple observation. The church is not mentioned in any tribulation context. It would not be mentioned anywhere in the Old Testament because the church is involved in the mystery. The mystery, as we saw previously, is something revealed only in the New Testament, not revealed anywhere in the Old Testament. So we did not, did not anticipate finding the church in any tribulation context, but you turn to the New Testament that deals with the eight different mysteries, of which five of these mysteries involve the church specifically. And in, in the tribulation context, New Testament, you will, never, you will never find the church mentioned. So for example, in Matthew 24 and 25, also Mark verse 13, also in the book of Luke verse 21, these are three New Testament gospels that deal with the events of the tribulation, the church is not mentioned one single time. And if you go to the epistles, whenever there was any reference to the church, there's no mention of the church actually being in any part of the tribulation here on earth. And the book of Revelation is the most significant book because the church is mentioned frequently in the first five chapters of the book of Revelation. The first five chapters mentions the church. We get to the tribulation chapters, which is most of the book, chapter 6 to chapter 18. Chapter 6 to chapter 18, the church is not mentioned one single time. Not even once. The church comes up again only in, in Revelation chapters 19 to 22, which deals with the events following the tribulation. And so on. The key book like Revelation that frequently mentions the church does not mention the church in any of the tribulation chapters, and most of the chapters are tribulation chapters. And so nobody who holds to a mid-trip or a three-quarter trip or a post-trip view can ever tell you or show you any verse that puts the church in any tribulation context. 
and you meet somebody the host to either a mid-trip or a three-quarter trip or a post-trip, simply ask them what question. Can you show me one verse that puts the Kela, Ecclesia, the church in any tribulation passage? And they won't be able to do it because it does not exist. Don't mention the church in any tribulation context. And so one key element, the church not mentioned any tribulation context of scripture, including those in the New Testament. Now with that, let's deal with the uh, three key passages that describe the rapture event. We'll begin with John chapter 14, verse 1. John 14, verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you if I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. This is in the context of what is now often called the Last Supper, which should be correctly called the Last Passover, because he was observing his last Passover meal in the context with these statements are being given. And he announces to them, they will soon be leaving them for a longer period of time. And he's gonna, and when he, leave, when he leaves with them, he's gonna go back to where he came from. Where did he come from? He came from heaven. And so, when they, so where he's gonna go back to, he's gonna go back to heaven. Not like in Mormonism, where he came to North America. He goes back to where he came from. He came from heaven, and he'll go back to heaven. And while he's in heaven, he'll be preparing a place for them. And only when the place is fully prepared will he come for them, so that you could then uh, come to where he was then going, and that was heaven. So what we find here is a special coming of the Messiah for one purpose, it that is to gather his apostles and to gather believers um, from the period of the apostles to take them to where he was then going. A special coming to receive the believers to take them into heaven. That is the point of chapter 14, verses 1 to 3. He's now describing the second coming for the purpose of judgment and so on. He's coming for a special coming for believers only to take them to where he was then going which was heaven. The second passage we shall look at will be 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Paul's basic procedures we find him doing throughout the book of Acts. He goes into a city. The first thing he does is he goes to the synagogue because the gospel is to be presented to the Jew first. And he presents the message of the gospel in the synagogue either one time or several times before he stopped. He was forced to stop. And from those messages, some Jews came to be believers. He now out to the Gentiles, and other Gentiles became believers, and then he organized them into a local church. And he would stay with them to teach the whole counsel of God. And while he would be teaching them, he would train men to serve either as elders or deacons. And when everything was established, he would appoint certain men to serve as elders. There's no such thing as a chief pastor in those days, but to serve as elders would be the authority, body of authority of the local church. And the church would be turned over to their authority and he himself would go to a new city to begin the process all over again. But he was unable to complete the process in Thessalonica because persecution and a severe persecution broke out very early and he had to flee from the city and therefore he was not able to teach them the whole counsel of God and therefore many biblical questions remained unanswered. It's obvious he taught them certain truths about the rapture, but there are certain things that were not clear. As so look at verse 13, we would not have your ignorant brethren concerning them that have fall asleep, 
that she shall run out, even as the rest who have no hope. For if, you, for if we believe that Yeshua died and rose again, even so them also of fallen asleep in Yeshua will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we her loud elect unto the coming of the Lord shall in no wise precede them that have fallen asleep. He begins in verse 13, is they do, he doesn't want them to be ignorant about a certain issue. And as you study anything about church history, you soon learn how fragmented the church has become over the centuries. And from the early days to the modern days, we have all kinds of denominations, we even have subdivisions in denominations, and so on. And among these denominations is the Brethren Church, we have the Plymouth Brethren, we have the Grace Brethren, we have the uh, Free Will Baptists, we have the Limited Baptists, and things of that nature. That is, there's, there's, no, there's no, nothing wrong being a member of any of those Brethren churches I just mentioned. There are others I didn't mention. There's one kind of church the Bible does, that the Bible will not permit to believers to be part of is the group that he mentions here in verse 13 where it says, I would not have you ignorant brethren. Never church and never join any church called the Church of the Ignorant Brethren because the Bible forbids it right here. What he does, the, does not want them to be ignorant about is the correlation between living saints and dead saints because in that persecution many believers were martyred and since they were martyred before the rapture, does that mean will they miss out on the benefits of the rapture? And the Thessalonian church wrote questions to Paul, and in both first Thess and second Thess, Paul simply writes answering questions that they had raised in the letters they written to him. And the Greek concern that the Thessalonian church has is that since some of the believers of the congregation were martyred, Will they miss out on the benefits of the rapture? And, he's, and he now will let them know not only will dead saints not miss out on the benefits of the rapture, in fact, the dead saints will receive the benefits even before the living saints. And so, what he now will do in verses uh, 16 and 17, he'll spell out the seven stages of the rapture event. They happen in very quick succession in the blinking of an eye but they happen in seven specific stages. So stage number one in verse 16, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. A time will come when the, when the messianic son will rise up from the right hand of God the Father who now sits and he'll descend from heaven into the earth's atmosphere. Second stage, with a shout. The Greek word for shout is that of a military commander giving an order. And he uses uh, military terminology in describing the rapture event in this specific passage. And so when the chief commander came out of his chief commander's tent, he would give a shout, a specific order for something to, to transpire. Then comes the third, st third stage with the voice of the archangel. There's only one archangel, his name is Michael, Michael in Hebrew, meaning who is like God. And keeping them the military motif, when the chief commander came out of the chief commander's tent, he would then give an order for the process of the rapture to, uh, to, be, to take place. And the chief commander's order would be repeated by the sub-commander. And so the sub-commander, Michael, will repeat the order of the chief commander. But then comes stage number four, with the trumpet of God. The trump of God. This continues the military motif because when the sub-commander repeated the order of the chief commander, the man with the trumpet will sound a specific trumpet sound. And based upon the sound he would make, then the soldiers would know how to respond, to go in this direction, that direction to pick up weapons, not to pick up weapons, and so on, will all depend on the trumpet sound. And then will come stage number five, the dead in Christ, in Messiah, will rise first. The dead in Messiah will rise first. Now here he explains why 
the dead believer will not miss out on the benefits of the rapture because before the rapture will affect any living believers, it will affect the dead ones first. And the dead ones in Messiah will be resurrected from the dead. And also the phrase in Christ or in Messiah, Paul uses certain phrases in a very technical way. In Messiah, in Christ, in Christ Jesus, in Jesus Christ, in Him, in whom, in the Lord. These are all technical terms for those that were baptized by the Spirit into the body. So the moment believers believe from Acts 2 onward, they're baptized by the Spirit into the body of the Messiah, and therefore the phrase like in here, meaning in Christ, it only refers to church saints. It does not include the Old Testament saints. The resurrection will occur at a different point of God's prophetic time clock, but it will affect only church saints. And furthermore, initially, only church, uh, dead saints of the church, because they're the ones that will be resurrected first. And then comes the next stage, that we, her life, the left, shall together with them be caught up in the clouds. So notice, only after the dead saints have been resurrected shall we who are living also be caught up. That's what the term rapture comes from, because the Greek word for rapture is harpazo, H-A-R-P-A-Z-O, H-A-R-P-A-Z-O, harpazo. And in the Latin Bible, it uses the a word that is the English source of the word rapture. The, the word rapture is based upon the Latin translation, not based upon the Greek word, but they all mean the same thing. That suddenly, living believers will be caught up. And then notice with whom Paul identifies himself with. He doesn't, look, doesn't think the rapture will be centuries away, as it has now been and therefore he did not identify himself with the dead saints to be resurrected. He identifies himself with the living saints to be raptured, to be caught out. That we, that includes Paul, that we who are alive shall together with them be caught up in the clouds. So because the rapture did not have any prerequisites, except for the first coming of the Messiah, which by this point is already history, therefore the, the rapture will happen and Paul will participate if he's living in the rapture event. But keep in mind here, and I'll pick this up again in the next passage, that he identifies himself to be with the living saints whenever the rapture occurs. And then we'll come to the seventh stage, to meet the Lord in the year, and so shall we evermore be with the Lord. So after the dead saints have been resurrected and living saints are caught up, then we together with the dead saints who are now resurrected will meet the Lord in the air. And then we shall, and then we shall from that point on be with him. So where do we go when we meet him in the air? And those who oppose tribulation will say, well, well, we'll make a U-turn and come back to the earth. That's not the promise of John 14. Remember the John, promise of John 14, verses 1 through 3, a special coming for believing and resurrected saints to take them into heaven. And so when we meet him in the air, he will then take us to <coughs> heaven. And then we see the results of it all in verse 18. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words, to no longer be sorrowful like those that have, um, have no hope, because um, dead saints will be resurrected before living saints are caught up. So it's, it's one thing to mourn for those that have died, especially died by martyrdom. That's to be expected. However, they should not mourn as if they, it was a hopeless situation. It is not hopeless. And again, the resurrected dead saints will benefit before the living saints at the rapture event. That's as far as this passage goes. Let's look at the next passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The entire context is verses 50 to 58. 
50 to 58. And what this passage will emphasize is the need to change the nature of the body whenever the rapture occurs. The need to change the nature of the body, including resurrected dead saints and caught up living saints, a change has to take place in the nature of the body. So look at verse 15. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither does corruption inherit incorruption. The kind of uh, bodies we now have, and the dead body has suffered corruption, the mortal body has to suffer from mortality, these kinds of bodies are not the kind of bodies with which we can enter into the eternal state. So there needs to be a change in the nature of the body. So the bodies of the dead saints now resurrected has to change in some kind of an immortal state, and living bodies also have to change into some kind of an immortal state. Keep in mind there are two kinds of resurrections, one kind is simply a restoration back to natural life. And we see people like Elijah, Elisha performing those kinds of miracles, but the people they resurrected all that again later. And even those not even the Messiah resurrected from the dead like Lazarus, all that again later. But the second type of that resurrection body is the kind of body that goes from corruption to incorruption for the dead body, and for the living body goes from mortal bodies to immortal bodies, so are no longer subject to death. And therefore there needs to be a change of those bodies for the reason that we cannot spend eternity in corruptible and mortal bodies. So in verse 51, Behold, I tell you a mystery. As I mentioned previously, the word mystery has a certain meaning in English that doesn't have the same meaning in the New Testament. And in the, the basic meaning that, that these kinds of um, situations have, the basic meaning is that at some point the body will die. But in the mystery, something else is going to occur. But let's define exactly what we mean by mystery. Keep your finger here, and we'll, we'll now look at the passages we looked at yesterday. But let's, let's just reconfirm it here in this study. And let's go to Ephesians chapter 3. Go, what number is your place in verse 15, 15? Go to Ephesians chapter 3. And look at verse 3. Ephesians 3.3. 3. For this course, excuse me, verse 3, how thou by revelation was made known unto me the mystery. Now there's our term. As I wrote before you in few words, whereby when ye read, you can perceive my understanding in the mystery, again the word, of Messiah. And now notice how he defines the term mystery. Verse 5, which in other generations was not made known unto the sons of men, as it has not been revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. And so a mystery is something that was previously totally unrevealed. Any biblical truth that was revealed in the Old Testament would not qualify to be a mystery. A mystery is something that is revealed for the first time in the pages of the New Testament and nowhere found in the Old Testament. And uh, it is now being revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. And so the mysteries in the, in the New Testaments are mysteries revealed for the first time by the New Testament. And then in verse 9 notice, to make all men see what is the dispensation of the mystery, does our word, which for ages has been hid in God who created all things as the subsequent verses show, now being finally revealed. So again, a mystery is something totally unrevealed in the history of the Hebrew Bible, revealed for the first time for the New Testament. Altogether, there are eight divine mysteries and two satanic ones. And, and so far, we haven't bothered to make the list, and that goes beyond the purpose of the study. But um, there are eight divine mysteries and two satanic ones. 
And now go to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians 1. And some of you have the first test book on the, in the appendices. There's a chapter entitled um, the, the, the Eight Mysteries of the New Testament. You can get all of the mysteries from that one appendix in the book called The First Steps of the Messiah. Now verse 25 of uh, Colossians 1. Whereof I was made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which was given me to you, word, to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery, there's that word again, which had been hid for ages and generations, but now has it been manifested to his saints, whom God was pleased to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Messiah in you, the hope of glory. And one of these mysteries is the indwelling Godhead within the body of the believer. But we're not dealing well with the mysteries to this day. We're focusing only on what specific mystery. Let's go back to the, to uh, 1 Corinthians 15. On these eight mysteries, is about what he's, he's going to define right here in this passage in verses 50 to 58. So verse 51, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not sleep. We shall all not sleep. We shall all be changed. In a moment, at the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incredible, and we shall be changed. As he begins to define the mystery of this chapter, he points out, we shall not all die. We shall not all fall asleep. We shall all be, uh, we shall all be changed. And he points out how quickly it will come in verse 52, in a moment. In Greek, does the word atom, uh, this word, in the atom of time, comes from this Greek word for what is rendered here as uh, in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, the twinkling of an eye is when we haven't seen someone we knew for many years. They're in a situation, maybe a meeting hall, maybe a restaurant, wherever we see someone coming in, and we know we know that person from somewhere. We don't quite know from what source we know them. But we look upon him or her, we then, like a flash, we finally recognize who that person is in our history. But the emphasis in the, is the quickness of the uh, recognition, once the recognition is finally made. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. In the same trump that is mentioned in the Thessalonian epistle, we already made reference to. And so, at the sound of the trumpet. So he mentions um, several steps, not all seven stages he did in the Thessalonian epistle, but he mentions specific steps. Number one, the last trump, the trumpet shall sound. Secondly, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and thirdly, we shall be changed. So he mentions three of those seven steps of the Thessalonian epistle. And those with whom like, he again identifies himself with, not with those that will be resurrected, but with those that will be living at the time of the rapture event, because the rapture has no preconditions outside the first coming of the Messiah. And once Messiah died, was resurrected, and went to heaven, at that point, the rapture was becoming imminent. It could happen any moment of time. There are no signs for the rapture. The signs that may lead to the coming tribulation, signs for the second coming, but there are no signs for the rapture. It can happen at any moment of time. And so, in a moment, in the atom of time, in the twinkle of an eye, the, sun, the trumpet will sound, the dead in Messiah shall rise first, and we shall be changed. And he goes on to spell out certain aspects of uh, what follows all this. In verse 53, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So for the dead saint, whose body has suffered corruption, corruption puts on incorruption. For the living saint, who lives in a mortal body, mortality puts on immortality. And so verse 54, with this corruptible shall put on incorrupt, 
in corruption and this mortal point immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that's written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the proud sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory to our Lord Yeshua the Messiah. Therefore, my beloved, brethren, always abound in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not vain in the Lord. And so the following verses, he points out the blessings for the corrupted bodies, now incorruptible, mortal bodies, now immortal, to be able to coexist and be taken up into heaven, because now the bodies are both uh, immortal bodies. Now those who hold to a uh, mid-trip and the post-trip <coughs> claim that this passage shows that the rapture has to be either in the mid-trip for those who are mid-tribulationists and or must be post-trip for post-tribulationists because this says the last trump. And what they do is to identify the term last trump with the seventh trumpet of Revelation chapter 11. And Mitras believe that happens in the middle of tribulation, the post-trips, and the afterwards of the tribulation. But this could not be the meaning of the last trump, for a very simple reason. Now when the Corinthian elders received this epistle from Paul and came to this section, and they raised the question, what does Paul mean by the last trump is what they could not do. They could not pull out the book of Revelation, turn to chapter 11 and say, well, this must be it. They could not do so because Revelation was not written yet, and won't be, for about 30 years. <coughs> it was written about 95 AD or slightly thereafter. And so the last trump is not a reference to the, to the, um, the seventh trumpet of the book of Revelation. The seven trumpets simply contains the seven bold judgments of chapters 15 and 16 of Revelation. So what does this actually mean in the context where it is found? Now, he was able to stay in Corinth for more than three years, so he had plenty of time to teach them the whole counsel of God, which included to teach them concerning the significance of the seven holy seasons, the seven holy um, of festivities of the Jewish calendar. There are seven all together. And the first four come close together, all fall within the time of the spring cycle. And these are the feast of the Passover, fulfilled by the Messiah's death, the feast of unleavened bread, the offering of his sinless blood, the feast of the first fruits, marking his resurrection from the dead, and the feast of weeks of Pentecost, which is um, which is the uh, feast marking the birthday of the church. Then you have a four month break. And then comes the fourth cycle that contains the last three. The last three also come close together, often only two weeks of each other. And these are to be fulfilled in the program of the second coming. So you have the feast of um, at the, the Day of Atonement. You have the feast of um, Sukkot, the feast of um, I shall begin with the Feast of Trumpets, followed by the Day of Atonement, and followed by the Feast of Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles. Now the Feast of um, Weeks, the Feast of, uh, I should say, the Feast of, uh, of um, Trumpets, and the Day of Atonement, which is not a feast, and the Sukkot Tabernacles. The Feast of Trumpets precedes the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement is fulfilled by the Tribulation, and this was National Atonement, this was National Salvation in the Tribulation. The Feast of Tabernacles is fulfilled by the Messianic Kingdom. But before the Messianic Kingdom and before the Day of Atonement comes the Feast of Trumpets. If you go to any synagogue, regardless of the nature of the synagogue, Orthodox or non-Orthodox, you'll find the person blowing the trumpet sound and he'll blow, he'll blow a total of 100 notes. The first 99 are of three different lengths. Some are short, some are long, some are staccato. When you get in the first 99 notes is a mixture of these three kinds of notes. When he gets to note number 100, 
called the Tekiyakdala. That is the longest note. It's as long as the blower can hold his breath. And that is referred to as the last trump. As St. Paul mentions the last trump, he's not connecting it with the seventh trumpet of Revelation. Revelation has not yet been revealed. It's revealed and only revealed to John, the apostle. However, the last trump is something in reference to the Jewish festivities. So go back to chapter 5 for a moment. It doesn't deal with all seven, but it deals with several others. First Corinthians chapter 5, and verse 6 and 7. First Corinthians 5, verse 6 and 7, he deals with the feast of the Passover. Then in verse 8, he deals with the feast of unleavened bread. Passover fulfilled by Messiah's death, and love, and love and bread by the offering of his tenderest blood. Then as you move to chapters 11 through um, 14, chapter 11 through 14, he deals with the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of Pentecost, dealing with the issues of the church. Then as you go to 1 Corinthians 15, and verses 20 to 23, 23 and 3 talks about the Feast of the First Fruits, and the Feast of the First Fruits is fulfilled by the resurrection of the Messiah. So we come to chapter 15, and verse 52, he makes one more reference, this time the Feast of Trumpets. And the synagogue service I mentioned, they blow the trumpet sound with 100 notes, with the last one being the longest note. And in Judaism, it symbolizes the resurrection of the people of Israel to bring them into the Messianic Kingdom. That's the rabbinic interpretation of the last trump. The resurrection of Israel to bring them into the Messianic Kingdom. And he picks up the resurrection motif. He doesn't deal with Israel's resurrection. He deals with the resurrection of the saints, the church saints, who be resurrected before living saints are finally caught up. So this, if this passage says anything about the timing of the rapture, it implies a pre-trip rapture, because trumpets comes before the Day of Atonement, the atonement is fulfilled by Israel's national salvation in the tribulation. So if it teaches anything about a pre-trib rapture, about the timing of the rapture, it indicates a pre-tribulational rapture. But again, the rapture has to come before the tribulation. And so that would be the indication, but it's not the main point. The main point here is to give us the issue about the difference between dead saints and living saints, and the benefits that both resurrected saints and living saints will have whenever the rapture occurs. And that's the main focus of this passage. Okay, we're going to stop here, and then in the afternoon session, we'll deal with the rest of the outline, the timing of the rapture event in connection with the tribulation, then deal with the judgment seat of the Messiah, and to some degree with the wedding, the most of the wedding aspect will be dealt with in our study tomorrow. All right, let's go ahead and open the floor for questions. Okay. Is the trumpet of the last trump a silver trumpet or a shofar, or don't we know? No, in practice, in Jewish practice, it's the shofar. By the way, I found the pass the, the box around. Go ahead. Okay, um, I'm, I'm going way back when we first started this, and you're talking about um, point number two in the outline uh, of Ephesians 2, where the body is composed of Jews and Gentiles, and you talk about the covenants of the Jews that were four and conditional, and the Adamic and the Noahic covenant that were relative to the Gentiles. And you said in all eras of time, we are saved by grace through faith. And faith uh, in what is the question, depending on... Well, the content of faith is what has been revealed. Right. And so, so my question is, can you give us an example of the content of faith that would be a saving faith to someone from 
either um, Ham or Japheth without any um, revelation of, of God in, in you know, the scriptures or, or stories through the Semitic line? Or, can you give us an example of what that light might be that was be a saving faith in these Gentile cultures? Well, it, uh, there's only there was no Jewish culture that early because the no, first no, thing no, you have no, to believe. Jewish. Let me answer your question. In Genesis chapter three fifteen, he he gave the prophecy of the seed of the woman, yeah. and that was the element of faith because in that prophecy, the seed of the woman will come and defeat Satan. You will bruise his head; he shall he shall bruise his heel; he shall bruise your head. And so the initial content of faith was the seed of the woman, as you move into the period of um, the line of Noah. It was his family line because the rest of the families uh, of the of the world were totally annihilated by the flood, and then he moved into um, the fact that there's going to be a special coming, and that when and Noah was born, his father thought he was going to be the Messiah. He'll give rest down to his people. Well, then he wasn't the Messiah, but he he was going to be the father of the Messiah, one of the things that will counteract the curse that God had placed upon in Genesis 3 is going to be eradicated by the seed of Noah. And then moves into the seed of Shem, going through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And you have the extension of the promise. It says nothing about his death so far. And then she moved into the period of the Torah. He spells out in, uh, in what the, was just different rules of life. But the content of faith still may remain the seed of the woman, the seed of Shem, the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and, and ultimately, and later on, in the seed of David. So that's the, that was the basic content of faith. Now, if you want to just turn for a moment to Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43, look at verse 10. He's addressing Israel now. Ye are my witnesses, says Jehovah, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God for, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am Jehovah, and besides me there is no Savior. I have declared, I have saved, I have showed that there was no strange God among you. Therefore ye are my witnesses, says Jehovah, that I am God. Yea, since the day that that day was, I am he, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand, and I will work, and who can hinder it. So here you have basically the content of faith, that they have to accept that God, Jehovah, is being the only God, number one, and also the only Savior. So if a Gentile believe this, then he'll be receiving eternal life. And if he asks the question, how do I now live? The answer is you live in accordance with the Adamic and the way of covenants. And if a Jew believe this, then how do he asks the question, how do I now live? The answer is you live in accordance with the law of Moses. And if when you have fall, there was the sacrifices available to cover your sin and things of that nature. So by the content of faith for both Jew and Gentile, but he was the only God, he's also the only Savior, but the rule of life was not the same. Gentiles, the Adamic, the Noahic covenants, the Jews, the Mosaic covenants. Only with the of the Messiah, when the middle wall was broken down, that all, both, all believers, Jew and Gentile, followed the laws of the law of the Messiah, not the law of Moses, and so on. Now we're going to pass the, the box for the, uh, for the offering this morning. And, uh, but uh, any more questions meanwhile? Yeah? Um, regarding content of faith, um, what do you think of the idea of the revelation of the gospel and the stars, the, the Matzeroth or the zodiac, where the 12 signs are really derived from, like, starting with the, uh, the prophecy of, uh, you know, that the serpent will 
know, bite the heel of the Messiah and he will cut his head. It, there's a book by Bollinger and uh, yeah. also James Kennedy. Uh, you, is that a valid view? Uh, I personally don't think so because the 12 signs of the zodiac are not really the call. David was required to know about these things because he became head of the school, the, the Babylon School of Astrology. Astrology and astronomy were not separate disciplines back then, but he never practiced astrology, he received no information from astrology. He clearly says he received the information neither directly from the God, from the, the, the God up in the heaven. And so I would not hold to the fact that astrology provides the information we need for salvation. The, the content of faith as it was delivered well, by I Moses mean, and the prophets. Those, those authors say that the concept of astrology is a corruption of the true thing, which is a, uh, a picture in the stars of the gospel story. Yeah. From, from an ancient perspective. I mean, I've, I've gone through all that. I don't see that as being really valid. I'm 